Albert Leroy Copper was a 28-year-old from Avonmore, Pennsylvania. He was a new father and loved to work on Mustangs. On June 6, 2013, he got up early as he usually did to head to work. Albert never arrived at his job, and his car was found abandoned on a dirt trail later that morning. He was never seen again. I'm Ed Densel, and this is Unfound. In the English language, we have a variety of terms for it. A gut feeling, a sixth sense, and I don't mean the movie, intuition, instinct, a vibe, a hunch. It's like we know something, but we really don't know why we know it. We don't have all the facts, but for some reason we believe we don't need any more info to know exactly what happened. We suspect that we know the entire picture before that picture is completed. We just know. I'm sure you've had this feeling many times listening to Unfound. Even though the case is unsolved, there may not be any suspects, we couldn't even prove it in court. But still, we all come to the same conclusion on a case without us knowing each other or knowing everything that could possibly be known. It's a strange phenomenon. In today's case, the disappearance of Al Copper, on one hand, you're going to hear what has become a pretty standard pattern on Unfound. Person disappears, car found abandoned somewhere. And I'm not sure you'll get that funny feeling inside at all. But then you're going to hear some of the unique facts that on their own that don't seem to be overtly bothersome. But taken as a whole, I think at the end you're going to have a suspicion that something bad happened to Al even though there is no proof of it. And now, a summary of the case. In the months leading up to Al's disappearance, he and his brother Matt were doing an entire interior remodeling of Al's house. Al was also talking about a time 16 years into the future when his newborn son would be able to drive the 2006 Mustang that Al had babied for a few years. In addition, Al worked long hours but had few complaints. On June 6, 2013, he left his house in Avonmore at about 3.45 a.m., like he usually did, to drive to Spring Church where the water truck he drove for a fracking company was kept. The plan was always to arrive at the destination before 4.30 a.m. Yet, this morning, he never reached work. He was never seen again. Later that morning, around 7.30 a.m., the car he was driving, a Hyundai Elantra, was found about a mile from his house on an ATV trail. Yet, there was a report filed later saying the car had been seen earlier that morning parked near the Avonmore Bridge. There were no signs of violence or anything unusual inside the Elantra, although Al's phone was on the passenger seat. Police and the public conducted a search near the car. They found no signs of Albert. There are many strange facts and unanswered questions in this case. Some of them are. Al was recorded on a convenience store camera the morning he disappeared, but the store is in the opposite direction from his job and where his car was found. The car was found by allegedly pinging Al's phone, but no one was even sure Al was missing at that point. And finally, ten days later, three men, including Al's mother-in-law's boyfriend, claimed they saw Al running across the Avonmore Bridge, although they were unable to catch him. Al's family believes foul play is the cause of his disappearance. His case remains unsolved. The interview for this episode is with Al's brother, Matt Copper. Unfound news. I had a chance to talk to someone from NamUs earlier this week. I'm not going to say his name, but we had a great conversation. This was my first time corresponding with that website. I had contacted them about a case I'm trying to cover for the Tribune Review but I also got to learn a lot about the nuts and bolts of what makes NamUs work. I hope to be able to use what I learned to help families get their loved ones on that database. Next, 
I continue to work on Volume 3. I know, it should have been done by now. But the first and foremost concern of mine is always the weekly episodes. Everything gets put on the back burner to the program you're listening to right now. And frankly, I've been getting a lot of families sent my way recently. And they always come first. Talking to them takes precedent over books, shirts, the website, etc. That's just the way it is. Finally, I need to give a shout out to Trace Evidence. That podcast recently covered the disappearance of Tiffany Daniels, just like Unfound did back in March. The host of the program directed his listeners to Unfound's coverage, so I would like to reciprocate at this time. Please check out Trace Evidence's episode on the disappearance of Tiffany Daniels. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound is on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Podomatic, Stitcher, Podbean, and Spotify. In particular, please join us on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern for the Unfound Facebook live video show, which is hosted on the Unfound podcast page, not in the private group. You can email the program unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. The website unfoundpodcast.com. Please check out the secret Stephen Kocher episode. The website at Trib Total Media, triblive.com forward slash news forward slash unfound. Unfound has Patreon and PayPal accounts. Your contributions provide for many of the items guests have received so far. I cannot thank all of Unfound supporters enough. Our most recent contributors are Christina and Anne. Unfound merchandise, volume one and two on Amazon in both paperback and ebook form. Let's try to work on getting some great reviews for volume two. If you've bought it, please go to Amazon and give it a nice review. The playing cards. Go to makeplayingcards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound podcast. Shirts for almost all unfounds cases at unfound-podcast.myshopify.com. This includes the flagship t-shirt, The First Year Cases. That has a collage of everyone from Suzanne Lyle to Jennifer Wilkerson in it. Please check it out. And please mention Unfound on all True Crime Facebook pages and other websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the brother of Al Copper, Matt Copper. Matt, welcome to Unfound. Thank you. Tell the listeners uh, a little bit about your brother, Al. First of all, was he your older brother or, or a younger brother? Older brother. Uh, by how many years? One year and 28 days. You know that you know the exact uh, year and days. That's that's interesting. Okay, that's a first friend found. What kind of relationship uh, would you say that you and Al had uh, growing up? And uh, did you have any other siblings? No other siblings, and we have a very good relationship. We got along well. Yeah. What kind of uh, interests did uh, you and he share? Uh, yeah. Being being in Pennsylvania, were you into like hunting and fishing, like a lot of guys are? Hunting, fishing, camping. He liked working on older cars. He preferred Mustangs and stuff like that. Yeah, and and were you into that too, or did you just uh, did you get into the cars as well, or was that just him? That was just him. I didn't get into the cars nowhere near as much as he did. No, and it was and it was just you two, you and your brother. Yeah. Okay. Great. I took a more conservative approach. He basically talk to your cars, everything. Okay. And uh, you guys, obviously, like you said, a year and 28 days, a difference. Did he play uh, any sports or in high school, or did he go to any higher education? What do you, what do, you do after, uh, let's say, after high school? After high school, while he was in high school, he did machining his secondary degree through Vertex. Hmm. And then he did track. But after high school, he just went straight into the workforce. Yeah, and, and what did he do? Do you remember? He did mechanic for a good while, and then he did the machining too. Normally, he was doing machining and mechanic, and then when I was a gas well boom hit, then he jumped into gas wells. Right, the gas wells, if uh, people don't know, Western Pennsylvania, within like the last 10 years, that's become big business, right? Big business. Yep. Yeah, a lot of money, people allowing uh, companies to come onto their land, and uh, the fracking that I think a lot of people all over the United States has heard about. So he got into that. 
Um, what can we say right now? I mean, she's going to play a huge part in uh, this case. But what can you say about the woman that he eventually married? Her name is Christy. We're not going to – well, we know that when she got married, her last name was Copper. But we're not going to give her maiden name. But what can you tell the listeners about Christy? I'm sure you knew her since your brother's married to her. Did they start dating in high school? How did their relationship, how did they meet? How did they get together? They started dating right after he graduated high school. She was finishing up high school. And I don't really know too awful much about her. I know she kept her and stuff like that. She was a beautician for a while. Okay, so Al was uh, older than she was. What? Uh, does that mean that she was in the same grade as you, or was she younger than you? Or She was the same age as me, but she was a grade behind me. I don't right. know if it was because of her birth date or what the reasoning behind it was. Okay, so somehow they – are you saying that they weren't a couple in high school? It was after high school that uh, they met somehow. Yeah. Okay. It was through a mutual friend. How long, uh, when, what year do you remember when they got married and uh, did they have any kids? And maybe you can just explain maybe Christy and her family a little bit uh, to the listeners. First of all, how long were they married before he disappeared? I'd say two years, maybe three years, but they dated for a good six to seven years at least. Oh, okay. Long, long courtship, I guess. Yep. And did you, uh, I'm guessing that all of you got together for holidays, maybe 4th of July, Christmas. Uh, yeah. How did their relationship seem over those years? What what did you think of your uh, sister-in-law in general at that time? We'll get into the actual the case stuff in a bit, but just at the time, how did, how did they, they those just, two look? Good. They were just very quiet because I wasn't really a very talkative person. He spent most of his time working. Mm-hmm. He always liked to work long hours, basically to put the money into his cars. But it seemed like a pretty good relationship to you. Were you happy for him when he got married? I guess so. <laughs> okay. I, uh, did you uh, did you think that he made a, a good choice? Uh, you kind of knew Christy, being that you went to the same high school? We didn't really talk in high school too much. She was always a shy one, basically like he was. So, I don't know. I think marriage is overrated, so... I well, <laughs> well, the list... <laughs> I was happy for him, but... Yeah. Yeah, well, the well, listeners know I'm single at 47. I've never been married, so... Uh, I, I perfectly understand what you're saying there. Um, did they have any kids? Yes, they had a son. And what's his name? His name's Emmett. Emmett? And how old was he, do you remember, when Al disappeared? I want to say like three or four months. Very young. Wow. Yeah, he wasn't old at all. He wasn't even a year yet. I remember that much. So let's move up to this. Let's talk about the days and months before he disappeared. What was going on in his life at, at the time? In particular, you have told me about how you and he were working on his house Remodeling it. How did that all happen? What were you doing? What kind of work were you doing inside his house? We did the exterior. We put wood siding up. We put floors down. All new walls up, or I should say interior walls up. The existing walls were there. Put new insulation in. Remodeled the bathroom. Remodeled the bedrooms. Put another bedroom on actually for him because it was a smaller house. New windows. Basically, complete gut and remodel, wiring, you name it, it was all new. So essentially, most of the interior of the house was changed, inclu- and then including the windows. Yep. That's a big job uh, for the two of you. I guess you're both uh, skilled in that? Yeah, we grew up working and helping out in construction companies like that while in school. And... And how long, how many, of course, he had a job at the time. Maybe you had a job at the time. How much, how many hours were you putting in this a week? It must make, it must have taken quite a bit of time to put that all together. Yeah, I'd say probably a good 30 to 40 hours a week. And then on top of it, he was working a good 
60 to 70 hours a week. So it's safe to say that uh, you were seeing a lot of them those days. Yeah. Okay. And how did you, uh, your impressions, uh, did he seem happy? Did he seem content? Uh, obviously, he's married to Christy. How are things uh, going in his life? And frankly, did he ever say anything to you that maybe thought, that made you think, um, maybe things aren't so great? Anything that you remember, Matt? He, he seemed a little bit stressed out because they were arguing a little bit back and forth, and I don't know if it was from mood swings from her being pregnant or not. Could have been that. And then didn't he also make a comment, if we can talk about this, about you were doing this remodeling, but he kind of had the idea that he really wasn't doing it for him and Christy. No, nah, because he thought the house was too small to begin with, so he never even wanted to remodel the house. He wouldn't buy something bigger. So he thought maybe that they were remodeling it. Could it mean that maybe her mother and her boyfriend were were going to be moving into it or something like that? Did he not tell you that a thought one day? He always thought that like it was pointless to remodel. It was too small of a house. He didn't see a point in actually having the house. He never said specifically like who he thought it was going to. But every or you could presume like how the house was going to turn out next, knowing it was next to her mom's hair salon. Yes, and maybe the listeners should know that Al and Christy are living in this house, but her mother and her boyfriend live right next door, the house right next door. Yeah. Okay, like within feet of each other. Yep. And I'm sure that uh, maybe made it things a little more uh, stressful too. So he and Christy were maybe arguing a little bit. Not hard to believe. Going to be new parents. Uh, she's several months pregnant. Maybe not. Uh, so, um, you know, a little bit stressful. Uh, just to be on it, just to ask you this question. Do you believe at any time they were dating or when they got married that Al ever cheated on her? Anything like that? No. Okay. Not to my knowledge. Okay. Now, what work was he doing uh, at the time of his disappearance? Maybe you can tell the listeners about um, this job he had. I, I had, I guess, driving a water truck. How long did he have that job? How did he get that job? What can you say? I'm not exactly sure on how he got it. I know he was there for, I'd say, at least six months to a year. And he was hauling water for the gas wells from PA, West Virginia, Ohio, New York. Oh, just depending on where the water was needed for the gas well. And was this a job that would, um, he'd have to drive overnight somewhere, or was this a job where he'd go out early in the morning and be able to be home, you know, in the afternoon or evening? It was a job that you just woke up early, and then you drove out to the location, dropped off, and then came back. It wasn't like whenever he was in gas wells as a mechanic where, you worked out of town on the gas or drilling rig. It was more you dropped off, turned around, came back, and then if there was enough time, if they needed more, you did another load. It all depends on your logs for the day. Okay. So he would be able to go out and do this work, and then like you said, maybe when he would come home in the evening, you and he would continue to work on this house. Did you happen to finish the remodeling of the house before he disappeared? All except for the heater. So you're really close to being done. Mine on the heater. Really yeah. close. Okay. What job did he have? Maybe th this might be interesting. What job did he have uh, before driving the water truck, and why did he switch jobs? Do you know? He worked at, at, in Oligo, New York, for a fracking company, and then he ended up swapping down to here because that's whenever the big flood hit up there and took everything out. So then he had moved back down to here. And then he started at Midas, and then he swapped to the water phones. And how did he like uh, that job? Did he ever say anything to you about it? Did he like yeah, it? he liked the freedom of basically being able to work on the gas well a lot because he was very mechanically inclined. And we're still not sure. Did uh, did Christie's mother's boyfriend, and we're going to talk about him in a little, little bit, is he the one that got him that job, or was it the opposite way that Al got that other guy the job? Because they kind of worked I'm together, not, didn't they? 
Yeah, they work together. I'm not sure which one got which one the job. All right. Because Bell could have applied on his own and got the job because he had class B and tanker endorsement and all that. Because he worked at a bus garage for a while before that, and then he did the toes and stuff like that and mechanical work for charter buses and everything in between the first diesel motor. Um, and how did he feel? Uh, this is another guy that's going to come up later. His name is Brian Swank. He was Al's boss. Did he ever say anything to you, once again, while you two were working, remodeling that house, spending a lot of hours together, anything about Brian Swank? He said that he, or I mentioned before that I thought about applying there, and he told me he wouldn't apply there. He didn't say specifically why he wouldn't apply there, but he told me not to apply there. And he never gave you a reason, didn't say, well, the job, Brian's an idiot, or it doesn't pay well, or he thinks the company's going out of business. Did he ever give you a reason? Not specifically a reason. He gave, like, a look like, what the heck was I thinking whenever I mentioned possibly working there. Did you, um, were you a little upset about that, not being able to apply to work for your brother? Did you just... No, not really, because we had a good relationship, so if I came across a good job or anything like that, and if I knew he was qualified for it, I'd let him know, and vice versa. Would you say that Al was was your best friend, Matt? He was close. We did a lot of things together. I'd say we had a very close relationship. It was more like best friends than brothers. And we don't have to get into any names, but besides you working with him, did Al have... Other friends that he confided in, maybe went out and had a beer with once in a while, or was he too busy to do that? Not really. He was a shy, quiet type. Like, in high school, he had friends and stuff like that, but lost contact over the years. And then whenever he was in New York working, he didn't really keep in touch with anybody from up there. And just to ask you point blank, to your knowledge, in in the years that you knew him, was he ever involved in anything illegal, underhanded, unethical, drugs, anything like that, to your knowledge? No, he was a very straightforward person. Like, if you go out and drink a beer, that's pretty rare. Like, I've only ever seen him drink a beer, I think it was once or twice, and it was at my one cousin's wedding. So, pretty straight-laced guy. Yeah. Okay. Now, here's something... Uh, we're obviously getting closer to his disappearance, and that might uh, this might have something to do with it. We don't know, but at one point, did he say that he thought he was being followed? Yeah. He Tell actually me. called me, and he wanted me to drive his Mustang because he thought somebody was following his car. Did uh, Was it like near his house or uh, was being followed to work or home for work? Did he get into the real specifics, or...? No. He didn't get into details about it. I remember he told me the one time he said they got pulled over, he was on his way back. That's whenever he still worked in New York. He said they got pulled over got by a guy that acted like a cop, and he thought it was weird because he came up and his knuckles were all bloody, and he just drove home. And you say you never heard another thing about it. That is a strange story. Where did that happen again? He didn't say exactly where it was, but he said it was on his way home from New York. So it could have been in New York or Pennsylvania. And if the listeners yeah. don't know where this happened, this is kind of in the area uh, where I grew up very close. In fact, uh, listeners should know the high school that Matt and Al went to, my father taught in that school district going way back uh, – couple decades ago so I'm very familiar with the area the school district the people uh, everything else in fact I I've been through uh, Avonmore Pennsylvania although not in recent years so he thought he was being followed uh, were you worried about that or did you just think he was being a little paranoid I really wasn't really too worried about it because we basically grew up in pretty strong so I knew he could handle his own if he needed to. Yeah, he could take care of himself. Um, yeah. Did he? Do you think that he ever mentioned that to his wife, Christy, or did he ever mention that maybe to your mother? You know, she might like to hear about something like that, or do you think that was just something that was between you two? I'm not really positive. I've never really 
ask anybody else if you mention it to anybody. And maybe the most important question is, did you actually trade cars with him or did you, did he just move on from that? No, we never actually traded cars. I thought about doing it afterwards, but the car was sold short or the car wasn't there shortly after that. So I couldn't really just take the car for a ride and see if anybody followed me. All right. So he thought he was being followed, but you don't know where that was. You don't know if it was in Avonmore or it was up on route, you know, whatever, route 56 or 66 going up to Indiana or anywhere else in that area, or three, you know, three fifty six. There's all sorts of numbers uh, for routes around there. You don't. He never gave you an uh, an idea of what was going on and where it happened. No, he never told me exactly where it was coming from. He just said that he thought somebody was following his car. And this is just once that this happened that he told you was being followed. Yeah, but it would have had to happen more than once if he brought it to my attention. I would assume. And how close is, best as you can remember, how close was this to him disappearing? I would say within two months. All right, so possibly April, March, April of 2013, somewhere in there. Yeah. Now, one more thing before we get to that day. Uh, The night before, you saw him and spoke to him. What was the conversation? And it had to, you had something to do with a grinder. But he had, yeah, I you stopped had... down the bar or get a grinder that my dad went in from whenever we were remodeling his house. I picked it up and he was telling me about how he was going to give the car to his son. And he was going to probably put it in storage as Mustang and he was going to go out and buy a new Mustang. And then basically we were discussing different options that he could do to his car the current Mustang that he had, so that way it was quicker and performed better, basically, for his son. And when you say his son, he was already thinking he only had one son, or did he have any other kids? No, he only had one son. All right, and this was the son that was just a few months old, and he was already thinking that far ahead? Yes. Okay. A um, little surprising, but I'm not a, a father. I don't have any kids, so I, maybe that's not so strange. Um, so he was talking about buying another Mustang. In retrospect, do you think that's a little weird given that he's remodeling his house? Uh, you know, he has a, a newborn. Usually people have newborns a little tight on money, and he's talking about buying another Mustang. Did that surprise you? Not really, because he was very big into the Mustangs, and he knew that one was going to become the collector's item because it was the first year that they came out with the old body style. Or I should say, they came back to the and redesigned the new body style. Correct, right? And so this was so. What year was that car? Two thousand six Mustang. Yes. Two thousand six, and so he was thinking about putting that into storage or something, and then getting a new one, maybe like a two thousand thirteen, two thousand fourteen. Yeah, he was thinking the two thousand thirteen because he liked the models better than the fourteens. Okay, so big Mustang guy, as I used to be at one time. Yep. All right, so anything out of the ordinary and and, and seeing him, corresponding with him uh, that night? No. No, just like any other night you two got together, whether to work on the house or whatever else? Yeah. Okay. We get to the day that he disappeared. Now, it's a lot of... um, it's a very this is a, the listeners should know this is a very very complex case, much more complex probably than people realize given the kind of coverage that it's gotten uh, since it happened. Um, but but Matt and I are going to go into these details as best as we can. So what is the uh, official story? What do you know about that day? Once again, I know you found a lot of things afterwards and. But just tell me what you know about that day, what has been told to you as far as the facts are. I was told that he woke up and he got ready for work. And then he kissed his wife on the forehead goodbye because she was still sleeping. And then he went to work. There was security footage of him at Honey Bear in North Washington of the morning of it, which is completely out of the direction. 
and then his car was actually found on the other side of Avonmore Bridge, so he would have had to backtrack. And it was parked there for so long, and there was eyewitnesses that said that they seen the car parked there. And then from there, it was probably a half a mile up over the gas well road. That's basically a quad trail whenever it was found. So this car, uh, he leaves for work, and he he left for work quite early. What Around what time? I was told at around 3.45, 4 o'clock in the morning, somewhere in there. Okay. And then you said he went to the Honey Bear, and I'm sure some people are going to uh, look these uh, places up. But this would be close to the intersection of 66 and 380, the Honey yeah. Bear. Yeah, but that is not in the direction that he should have been driving if he was going no. to go into his job where he was going to get this truck uh, to pick up. But you're saying that this his car was eventually found um, not even on a regular road, but on what kind of a an uphill dirt road slash ATV um, yes. path, trail. Uh, what kind of car was this? Uh, in four maybe 2002, Hyundai Elantra GT. All right, it's uh, a Hyundai, Hyundai Elantra, not a car that you'd probably take off-road. No. Not at all. Especially with the tires that are on. They probably only have three thirty seconds to on the rain that we had that during then. Okay. So the car was uh, had bald tires, and we're to believe that he tried to drive it up this ATV trail for some reason. Um, how far is this trail from where he lives? Probably about a mile, maybe a mile and a quarter. Not far at all? No. Not far at all. And what time, we'll get into how it was found, who found it, but at what time was the car found? I'm not sure on the exact time. I would say probably like 8.30 Okay, 9 o'clock in the morning. I never seen the actual police report to specify the exact times. Okay, but I think what we can say is it was found, the car was found fairly quickly. Yeah. All right, so you you say that he left at 3.45 in the morning. Uh, he w went to this, allegedly, this honey bear. And you sh we should know, just so people know, you've actually seen the picture of him in that honey bear? Yeah. All right, and it says... Do you remember even, did you get to see a picture that had a time stamp on it? No. No. All right. There wasn't a time stamp on the one I was seeing. Okay, but it is verified that he was seen out there. Yes. And then not long after that, though, so he gets up at 345 in the morning, goes to the Honey Bear, and his car is already found, let's say, before 9 a.m. that same morning. Yep. How did how did the car, being that it, once again it wasn't parked right along a busy street, it was up on an ATV trail. You have been told how this car was found. Why don't you tell the listeners uh, allegedly how the car was found? I was told that the police pinged his phone, which is kind of odd that they would ping it so quick. Knowing a cop murderer can not have his phone pinged for three to four days after somebody murders a cop. But I was told his phone was pinged, and then his boss actually found his car up the gas well rig. So how did this even get started? How did anybody even know that Al was missing to the point where they are able to ping his phone so quickly? I was called, like, at first late by his wife, and she asked if my parents or if my brother stopped at my parents' house because I spent the night there, and I said no. And then, next thing I knew, she said he didn't show up for work. And then I got a call. I don't remember who called me. That they were calling him, calling him in as a missing person. And I was surprised that the police would actually get involved so quickly in a missing person because normally it's 24 hours, and then if there's nothing heard, then in 48 hours they'll actually release a missing person report. So are you saying that the reason that this this uh, search started was because Al didn't get to work at the time that he should? Yep. And how far is the drive, would you say, you being a local, 
to get where he had to go get his truck from Avonmore, where he lived, out to where the truck was. How long of a drive would that take? That would take about 20 minutes. I would say it's about 7 to 10 miles. Okay. And you really don't know uh, what time he was supposed to get to work? Like, you know, was there a clock in time or anything like that? I don't know if there was a clock in time. Usually gas wells, they just have you ready on paper because they don't know where you're going to be that day. And it's easier to just turn in your car at the end of the week. Okay. So he got, maybe he left his work at 345. Let's say that he was supposed to get to work at 430. So already like four hours later, four and a half hours later, his car is found. And the call was reported by his boss, Brian Swank. Is that right? Yes. Because now he, whenever I showed up, it was Brian Swank and an officer running from the Kissy State Police territory at the car. Okay, so we are to believe that Al doesn't show up for work on time. Once again, the listener for the listeners, a fairly complicated case. Al doesn't show up for work. Brian already is calling the cops. I, mean, I don't did, know if he called the cops. Did 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 you to your knowledge, did Brian ever call his house? Did Brian ever call you if he went and had your number? Did he ever call your parents' house to even ask where Al was? Not to my knowledge. I don't know if Christy called him, his wife, or anything like that though. Okay. Now the very interesting part about this is not only was Brian he would have had to have been the person who initiated the search. Who was the person who first found Al's car? Brian. And does, to your knowledge, does Brian live anywhere near this ADV trail, and is his business anywhere near this ATV trail? The ATV trail, the only way that you know it's there is if you went to Eagles Point back in the mid-'90s. Brian's house ain't known near... Avonmore, and his business is definitely not near Avonmore, it's 10 miles on the other hillside, or not the other hillside, a couple hillsides over, and there would be no reason for him to haul water up here or anything like that, because the guy that owns the property, you can drill your own gas well if you have the equipment, or the other guy that owns the property drills his own gas wells because he owns a drilling company. So the way Brian found the car, he says, is how? He never gave a reason how he found the car. Okay. But what you were, what you were told is that somehow the state police found out about it, already pinged okay. Al's phone, and they were able to track it, the car, to that location. Not to that exact location. They mm. said Hicks's Hill. Which Hicks' Hill goes for eight miles. So still, they rode around that that area, and that's where they found the car. Yeah. Okay. And so, when did you personally find out that something went on that morning? Whenever Christy called me at like first light, so I'd say probably like seven thirty, eight o'clock in the morning. And what'd she say to you? That Al didn't show up to work. He was, she was wondering if he was at my parents' house or anything like that. And so at this point, you, are you saying that she didn't know that the card was going to be, hadn't been found at that point? Yeah. Okay. When did you find out about the car and what did you do? I was with my grandmother because whenever they said Hicks is Hill, we took Road out Hicks is Hill up to Eagles Point where most people hang out of that. Turned around, came back, just got back to my house, and then my mom called. I think it was my mom that called. Somebody called and said the car was found and explained the road that it was on. So then we drove right back out, so I would say about 15 minutes after, maybe half an hour afterwards. How did you even know to look up on that hill? How did you even know to go out with your grandma and, and look in that area? Who told you to look up there? They told me the car was already found. They told me where it was. It's a way to get into where the car was. Oh, uh, okay. 
Who who told you that? My mom. Your mom did. And what did you see when you first uh, went up there in the car? What was found in the car? What what do you know about all of that? There was a black hoodie put over garbage that was on the floor because he always stuck his cigarette packs. He'd just throw them in the passenger seat and stuff like that, then clean his cars out at the end of the week. There was a black hoodie over the garbage on the floor, and then the officer, Leonard, was there with Brian talking, and they wanted Ponderella's garage to hook up and tow it. And Condor said, you should fingerprint him first before we even move the car. And they didn't want to fingerprint the car. And basically, they were just standing there having a discussion when he didn't even do an investigation at all. What was found was this, uh, we talked about the ping. Was the phone that was pinged, if we are to believe that, the phone, uh, was it found in the car? That I am unsure of. I'm pretty sure the phone was recovered. And then I've heard that the wallet was, but I've never seen the wallet or the phone. To you, uh, now that all these years later, was there anything else missing out of the car? Something that you think that should have been found in the car that wasn't? I guess what I'm saying is besides Al missing, is there anything else missing that might have been in the car? Work boots. There was an empty box with work boots in the back, which I knew were too small for him because he was going to return them. And the box was there, but the work boots weren't in the box. And you have no idea whether he returned them or not? He would have had to use the box if he returned them. That's a good point. Did anybody kind of uh, try to fan out and see if Al was in the, the immediate area, or was were people just standing around? At that time, they didn't, the like, police didn't do a search, but they did do search parties with Cadaver dogs and stuff like that. They shut the lock down to check the creek or the river, I should say. They brought in search dogs and then people on foot searched that day and then the day after there was a big search party. And then I think the following Saturday there was another huge search party. And Anything found? Anything of Al's? Any signs? Any uh, blood stains in the car? Let's just say, for example, anything that, that could point you or the police, anybody, in any direction? No. Okay. Uh, did you put up any flyers? Uh, did, I guess, Christy, of course, having a very young child, did she try to help out in any of this? How about her mother, uh, her mother's boyfriend? Yeah, she helped print flyers off. Like, my parents printed flyers off, my aunts and stuff like that. There's flyers spread the whole way down into West Virginia, to Petersburg, West Virginia. There was other people, friends of the family and stuff like that, that posted them around Texas. And that's the, almost everywhere in between. A lot of people from Gaspo that we both knew were spreading them out. The traveling company that he did the mechanic work for, they posted them in their charter buses. And once again, to your knowledge, anybody ever see Al, any rumors of being seen anywhere, anything like that you've ever heard about? There was anonymous tips and stuff like that. People would call and say that they've seen him a couple of different places and stuff like that, but nothing ever stand out. There's a lady from Edmond that swears that she's seen him forced to cross the Edmond Bridge that morning. Yeah, you said that there was a alleged sighting that the car was not seen originally on that trail, but down by the bridge, somebody said. Yeah. Uh, do you happen to know who that person was? Uh, did the police check that out? Do you know what the the end to that um, sighting was? By what she said, by what she said was the, the police never contacted her back. So his car's found. The police there... Somehow, Brian, who is the guy that called it in, is also the person that found his car out in this back, found Al's car in this back road. Somehow, there's a state cop there. Uh, you show up there. No signs of Al. There's some things in the car. Some things are missing. You had said that uh, the tow company didn't want to take the car away until the car was fingerprinted. Was any forensics done on the car as it sat on that trail that day? 
Nope. None. Not to my knowledge. None. Now, of course, you just saw your brother the night before. You were seeing a lot of them these days, those days, because of the remodeling. What were you thinking at the time? I didn't really know how to take it because he ain't the type of person just to disappear. He ain't the type of person not to tell you what he's doing. But he usually will say, hey, I'm going to do this. And the day that it all happened, he was actually supposed to because I bought a truck off of him. He was supposed to, I forget which part he needed. I want to say it was the power steering pump. He was supposed to stop up after work and help me put it in. And at that time, do you think that it was possible that maybe he just kind of had some mental episode and ran off into the woods? Did you think maybe the the pressure of being a new father and stuff, he ran off? There is speculation of that, but I don't presume that he'd make plans to work on a vehicle with me mm-hmm. if he was going to do something like that. So these are, those are the facts, just not being able to find him, and of course the case is still unsolved to this day. We now want to get into the very uh, peculiar particulars of this case. If you don't think that it's kind of, um, it's a very, I have to tell you, uh, Matt, this is one of the strangest cases I've heard about, and this just happens to be uh, in the backyard of where I uh, grew up. Um, These are some very strange facts. So let's start here. First, the car. We'll get back to the the Hyundai Elantra GT. Did Al usually drive that car to work? No. Who usually drove that car? His mother-in-law. So Christie's mother was usually the one driving this car. And what car did Al usually drive to work? His 2006 Mustang. All right, this one that he told you that uh, he was going to be saving, maybe put in storage for his son. Um, what car did Christy usually drive? Did she have her own car? Yeah, she had a Mazda MX-6, I think they are, or an MX-8. Okay. And is there any reason that you can think of that Al would have driven that car that morning? Moreover, has Christy's mother ever voiced an opinion why he would take her car to drive to work that day? No. None at all? Nope. Nobody ever gave a reason why he was driving that one. Okay. Uh, I I have to tell you, having been a previous Mustang owner, that I would probably rather drive the Mustang to work as well. You said the tires uh, were bald. Did he have any plans to get those changed at any time? No, because he was actually trying to sell the car. But the problem was is nobody really wants to pull to the car. Or not unless you got a family, but he preferred more of a sportier car. And his wife's car was had three doors, so you can put a kid easily in there. So we have this car that um was found on this trail. And it's a car that he did. Let's put it this way: in all the years that you drove him, how, knew him, your your brother, how many times would you say that you saw him drive that car? He bought that car basically because he used to have a cab. Well, well, first he had a Mustang, and then he had a Cavalier, and the Cavalier got totaled, and they picked it up at his work, and that was the closest car dealer to his work that had something cheap because he didn't want the car. And he bought that to build credit to buy a newer Mustang. And I, at first he drove it for a couple of years, I'd say about a year, and maybe a year. And then he built out the credit for his Mustang, and then he bought the Mustang. And did he buy the 2006 Mustang new or used? or? No, he bought the Mustang used because he wanted to get a new one, but they changed the body style, so he wanted the original body style that they first came out with because it resembled, I think, a 67 Mustang. That's, yeah, the the old one's going back right to the late 60s. In what year would you say that he bought that 2006 Mustang? Do you know? I would say probably 2008, 
maybe 2009, somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. And that was the car that was his primary driving car? Yeah. All right. What about in the winter, those Pennsylvania winters, Mustangs aren't too good in the snow. What would he drive then? He would actually just put eye flakes on the Mustangs. So that was his primary car from when he got it, and you probably hardly ever saw him drive the Elantra ever after he got the Mustang. Correct. All right, but we are to believe on that particular morning, he's driving the Elantra instead. Yep. Okay. Next, the honey bear. We've already talked about this. Uh, you have seen that picture of Al at the honey bear. Does, what's he doing? I mean, it's just a picture. It's not a video. Is he standing at the counter? Do you remember, you know, what? He how does he look? From the, he looked good. He was walking from the counter. It kind of looked like he might have been nervous. And he had a Mountain Dew in his hand. And uh, was he known to drink Mountain Dew? Yeah. He drank and, every energy drink known to man. And when did you, obviously maybe didn't find out about it this day, that day, when did you find out about this photo, and uh, when did you finally get to take a look at it? I would say it was like a week or so afterwards I found out about the photo, and I got to see it. it might have been a little bit longer. I have to ask, you. we established that this honey bear is not actually on his way to work. It's, no. It's pretty much almost in the opposite direction, so I'm wondering... Have you ever heard how the store owner, and, and I want the listeners to know, I've been in this Honey Bear. I've been in that convenience store. It's been years ago, but I know that store. Um, how did that store owner even know to check his video for something like that? Do you even know how, being that it's in the opposite direction, I'm sure if you were looking for him, the cops were looking for him, they might look at convenience stores on the way to work, not in the opposite direction. How did that all happen? I'm not sure how the photo came about. I know that that my mom and aunt went around to the different convenience stores and asked about checking surveillance cameras and stuff like that to see if maybe he was on them. But I don't know if they came forward and said themselves or if basically they stopped and they're like, yeah, we got a picture of them. And how far is the honey bear from where his car was found? Probably 15 miles away. And to believe it, he would have had to have backtracked the way he came. Yep. To, to, so if we're to believe that he was in Avonmore, he goes to the honey bear, and then, like you said, his car was only found not too far from his house, but on this ATV trail, he went back in the same direction. Um, yep. did, you ever know, did you ever know Al to go to that store? No. No, he usually went to Quick Pick in Salzburg where he would go to the sheets because he liked breakfast, plain coffee. And so you've never, have you ever been in that store? Yeah. Okay, you have, but you don't think that Al, do you, can you think of any reason that Al would have been in that area, which is kind of known as Washington Township in that area? Any idea why he would have been out there at all? No. He had any business out there? Did he, does he know anybody in that area? Anything? Not to my knowledge. <laughs> I can see if it was like a path through on his way to work, but the closest gas station to his house is Salzburg, so it's kind of pointless to drive 15 miles out of your way or so. Mm -hmm. Go to a gas station and backtrack the whole ways. That's very strange. Halfway back to your work. It's it's very strange. I, it, you're absolutely right, Matt. Um, when you got to see the picture, was it like a physical picture, like on a piece of paper? Or did you see it on a on a phone, or did you see it on a monitor? How did you get to see the picture? I seen it printed off copy, but it looked like all it was is a surveillance video. It didn't look like there was an actual picture. It looked like they paused it to print it off somehow. I don't know if that's possible or not, but. It was I, like an action picture, so that's what led me to believe it came from a camp or a video surveillance, and then they took it that way. And are you or your family in possession? I'm sure the cops have one. 
Or do you or your family have a copy of that picture? Yes. You do? Yep. You do. Uh, I would love to see that. I didn't know that. That's, I think, maybe the first time I ever asked you. If there would be a way that you could send me a file or some scan it or something, yeah. I would love to have that picture in publicity for this episode, uh, Matt. I would love to see it for myself if you could make that happen. I can do that. All right. Thank you. I, I deeply appreciate that. Listeners should know I've never asked them that question before until right now, um, but I'm glad I did. Thank you, Matt. I deeply appreciate that. Um, so you got to see it. You you now have it, and the general consensus between your you your, yourself, your mother, your father is that Al just kind of looks like Al, although you said he looks a little worried. Yep. Okay. And are you absolutely certain that is Al in the picture? Yeah. One hundred percent. Yep. Okay. So he's seen on this video camera uh, in the complete opposite direction on the morning that he disappeared and nobody knows why he was over there. And he's, of course, driving a car that he usually doesn't drive. Uh, do you know, let's maybe stay on this for just one more moment. Uh, could anybody verify that they saw Al actually driving the Elantra at that honey bear? No, because we tried to get, there's a subway at the old video city that faces that direction too. And we tried to get a copy of their video surveillance cameras but they said after so many hours that their tapes re-record over everything okay when we asked about exterior cameras at the honey bear and the exterior cameras didn't show him getting in the car or nothing all right so all you got was a picture of him you didn't get any video or pictures of him getting out of his car getting out of the elantra anything like that no all right and I should ask before we move on to the next topic, um, is there any proof that the Mustang, just to get a little conspiratorial here, is there any proof that the Mustang might have been driven that morning instead? No, there's no proof of either. Okay. Let's move on to the next uh, issue here, and that has to do with Al's boss, Brian Swank, somebody that we mentioned earlier. Of course, he is the... The boss, he was the guy who allegedly uh, was very uh, a good citizen, letting everybody know that Al hadn't gotten to work, and then he is the guy who allegedly first came across the car as well, allegedly using information that um, from uh, the pinging of the phone, and we're going to get into that in, in the next. But Brian Swank, um, Christie's mother's, boyfriend his name is butch are he and brian friends yes do you have any idea on how they might have known each other did they know each other outside of al working for brian that i am unsure of you don't know okay and have you ever had an opportunity yourself in the last roughly five years to talk to Brian, uh, maybe you saw him at the time. Did you talk to him about finding the car? Uh, any co conversations you have ever had with Brian at the time? I've seen Brian at the car whenever it was found, but he didn't even really associate with anybody. The only person he associated with was the investigating officer at that time. Okay. You never had a chance, or maybe your parents, or even Christy, uh, to have a conversation with him um and to to explicitly get explicitly get an explanation on how he found the car first not that i'm aware of i never personally have no oh. but i'm pretty sure my parents never even got to really talk to him and you are quite sure at least the way you understand the events that he got to the car before the police did or vice versa i'm not sure who got to the car first? I imagine Brian, because I remember the call I got was, is Brian's at the car, the car is up the Gaswell Road going to Hicks's Hill. And I said, well, I'm coming from Hicks's Hill. There's no car there. And then they said, no, it's the first right going across Davenport Bridge, not the new road to Hicks's Hill. Okay. And whenever I pulled up, Brian was there just laughing, carrying on, talking to the officer at the scene. 
Now, let's move on. We're going to come back to Brian in a bit, as Matt knows. But let's talk about, we've mentioned this officer. Um, we're just going to use his name. He was the officer on the scene when you got there. And what's his name? Officer Leonard. All right. His first name is Owen Leonard, if anybody wants to know. He was the first policeman on the scene. Is he a local cop or is he a state cop? He's a state cop out of the Kiskey Barracks. And that kind of boggled me because as soon as you hit the bridge, you're in Armstrong County. So why is it? I understand state cops can go in either county, but it's kind of odd that you're going to jump into a different cops jurisdiction versus calling somebody in to pursue an investigation. Yeah. Uh, we should be killer. Avon Moore is in what, Westmoreland County? Yes. All right, and then you go across that bridge that is north of the town. On the other side of the bridge is Armstrong County, the county I grew up in. And then how far from that bridge is this ATV trail where the car was found? Probably about a half a mile to the bottom entrance from the road. Mm -hmm. And then probably another half a mile up over is where the car was found. So the Kiskey Barracks, which is in Westmoreland County, uh, maybe you think it a, a little weird being a local who still lives there, that he's over um, not far into the other county, like you said, a half mile, then another half mile. But here's the interesting part. Uh... Owen Leonard and Brian Swank know each other. Yes. They're actually brother-in-law. That's right. What I was, uh, listeners should know that Matt had originally told me this, and of course that's something, when something like, I hear something like that, I have to verify it. It appears to me that Owen Leonard's wife and Brian Swank's wife are sisters. I think. Pretty close. I'm pretty, pretty, pretty sure. But they know yeah, each other true. outside of him just being a business owner and him being a cop. They are related somehow. Correct? That was my first. Yep, that's how I was explaining it, too. Okay. That's how the police stations are different now because the investigating officers are different now because of conflict of interest. When did you find out, and how did you find out? Because that's, I don't believe that would be something that would be... Um, common to find out. How did you find out eventually that Owen Leonard and Brian Swank are related through marriage? Because I went through custody court with my youngest daughter shortly after that. I'd say within like four months or so afterwards. And my ex-attorney was actually another or I should say a biological brother of Brian. And he told me that you know, the officer on that case shouldn't be on that case. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, they're brother-in-laws. That's conflict of interest. And I said, that's interesting. And I asked him how he knew it. And he said, Brian's my brother. I haven't talked to him in 10 to 15 years at least, just because of the way he is. Yes, and we're going to talk about We We will talk about that in a second. So that's how you came to find out. So you were standing there that morning that Al disappeared. You're seeing the cop with Brian. They're getting along. You never knew at the time that they probably went way back as knowing each other. Correct. Yeah, you thought maybe that they were just meeting for the first time that morning. That was certainly not the case. Correct. All right, and was it that state cop, Owen Leonard, who said that he didn't want to do any forensics on the car that day? Yes. All right. He said there was no body, there was no crime scene, nothing to suspect the crime. Okay. And we are to believe, is it your understanding then, that if we are going to believe that the car was found through some sort of pinging of a phone or something, that it was Owen Leonard who did that? I would presume they never came out and said that he pinged the phone or anything like that. I know different per missing people cases and stuff like that. Remember, I was in the fire hall, it usually took at least a day. Yes, that is, you can do with it. that is something that is, uh, I'm going to show my listeners are very astute. They're very smart. They know a lot about a lot of missing persons cases. And I can tell you, this is the quickest that uh, uh, a missing persons case has ever gone to the pinging of a phone. There, there's no doubt in my mind. If Once again, if we are to believe that, and I'll have a chance to talk about that in my summary. Um, you talked about why was the case once again moved to the uh, different jurisdiction. Um, and what jurisdiction did it go to, Matt? 
it went to Westmoreland County, and then there's a couple of different barracks, but there's Robert Hart in the Greensburg State Police Barracks that took over the case. All right, and is he still responsible for it to this day? Yes. Okay, and and was that something that you initiated after you found out what this other law law this lawyer told you, or was that something that the state police did on their own? I didn't have the authority to because I was just considered a brother, so I basically had my mom push the, push the button to make it work. Are we to believe then that um, – this wasn't something that Owen Leonard did on his say. He didn't come forward and say, you know what? Uh, Brian Swank, we're kind of related. And, uh, you know, maybe it'd be best off just to, you know, just to be absolutely 100% ethical on this, that no. it should, he, he did not say that. If In fact, if you didn't know that, it could be that the Kiski Barracks, Owen Leonard would still maybe be responsible for this case. Yeah. He did not reconcile on his own honorably like he should have and he actually never even released the car to the Greensburg barracks to do an investigation like he should have he didn't never the car nope when the car was picked up it was picked up at the Kiski barracks and where is that car now maybe that's a good question what is the, where is that a launcher now in my parents backyard you still because have it you're they ain't ever sold. and how long, that's interesting, how long after this all happened did they get the car back? At least two years afterwards, maybe three years afterwards. So it sat up, and I know exactly where the Kiski Barracks are. That's where it sat that whole time? That's what they, that's what they state. Whether it was actually there the whole time, who knows. Okay. And once again, did they, do you, to your knowledge, did they do any forensics? Did they do any fingerprints? Uh, was there any blood that they discovered in the car? Any DNA? Anything like that? Not to my knowledge. I was never told they fingerprinted it. I never seen a docket sheet on the case or anything like that. Nothing was ever uploaded to UJS, to the public knowledge website. And uh, how long did it take for the, the case to get transferred from the Kiski Barracks to the other barracks? How long after Al disappeared, how long did that all take to happen? That was about a year afterwards is whenever it finally got swapped over. It okay. could have been a little bit longer. Okay. Because they weren't too happy about mentioning it. it was a conflict of interest. They tried to keep it there, actually. Very... It's... That's a heck of a coincidence, and it should be known. Now, maybe this is something that I just thought of at this second. Once again, listeners need to know I am very familiar with all of this area. I've been on these roads back in my youth, growing up in Armstrong County, and this is a case you should know that I'm in working in, um, in conjunction with the Tribune Review. This is not a case they're going to be covering. In fact, they did an article on Al's disappearance just last summer. So that's why this case, this Western PA case, is being featured on Unfound instead. Um, and I'm continuing. I'm going to be working with Tribune Review uh, for other cases for the rest of 2018. I'm looking forward to that. But how close is the Honey Bear to the Kiski Area State Police Barracks? Probably a quarter mile off the road. In between a quarter mile and a half mile. Matt is telling the absolute truth on that. So... Al was seen at this honey bear that morning. We don't know why he drove in that direction. And then a state cop is on the scene, maybe a little bit out of his jurisdiction, his area, maybe. And his own barracks is just a quarter mile, half mile from where Al was seen earlier that morning. Correct. You mentioned your uh, wife, maybe your ex-wife. Uh, I don't know how you'd like me to term this, but... You were in court not long after Al disappeared, and let's just go through that once again uh, one more time. Her lawyer, whose name is Greg Swank, um, did he approach you about all of this, or did you approach him? How did? What do you remember about that day when you had this conversation about his brother, and you found this whole uh, connection out? We were at a custody pre-trial conference where you try to work things out between each other. And he was actually talking to me while 
he waited for his client, my ex-girlfriend, to show up. And you were saying how it was odd about how they had choppers up in here and everything, they pinged the phone so fast and everything like that. And I said, yeah, I thought it was kind of odd, too. I was in the fire hall, and he said, saying about how he walked that trail forever. And then he goes, I got to tell you something. I said, well, what's that? He said, the investigating officer shouldn't be on that case. And I asked him why he shouldn't be on there. And then he said about how that he was actually related to the boss. And that's a conflict of interest. There should be a different officer doing the whole investigation. He said from walking that trail, because it goes down into Apollo, which is probably three, maybe four mile walk down over. He said he didn't understand how anybody could walk up and down those cliff sides or anything like that. And at what point did Greg tell you uh, during this conversation that about his brother? I mean, you didn't know that, that the, maybe you saw the new the last name, but did you ever put the connection together that Brian and Greg were brothers? No. Actually, he never even said his last name. He just said, I'm Greg. And then he came out and told me that it, Brian was his brother. And the, the listeners should know that I've verified that. That is absolutely true. And Greg said that he hadn't talked to his brother in a long time. What did he have to say about his brother, Brian Swank, who, once again, was Al's boss? He said the reason he didn't talk to him is because of the way he presented himself and the type of habits that he got himself into. And he I left... didn't know anything of it at that time. Mm-hmm. And I could tell like he was a legit person because he's not going to come up to me and tell me information to help on my brother's case if he wasn't going to be an honest person. Right. Greg led you to believe that Brian was involved in some illegal stuff. We'll just leave it at that. Correct. He told you that. Yes. Greg Greg told you that. Yes. And the people should know uh, that Greg Swank is a very reputable lawyer. Uh, he's represented... Um, he has a very good reputation in that area of Pennsylvania. In fact, right now he is representing the wife of the police chief in my hometown of Leechburg who got caught trying to pick up a 14-year-old. And Greg Swank is representing this police chief's wife as she divorces him and takes him to court and probably takes him for everything that he's worth. Um, that's who Greg Swank is, and I also saw his name from other, some other high-profile cases. And there he has a very good reputation. His brother Brian, not so much. So... Um, Matt was getting this information from someone who I believe uh, to be a good uh, good citizen. You had to be shocked when you heard all that. I bet you didn't know. Uh, you were, of course, thinking so much about your custody hearing. I'm sure you didn't realize that was going to happen when you went to that meeting. No, not at all. I didn't expect them to be an honest person. I expected, you know, attorneys that are there to screw each other and make as much money off the best parties as they can. But he earned my respect with that one, that's for sure. Right. And uh, would you say that, uh, as Greg, once you got into this custody hearing and everything, and we're not going to get into your private life, would you say that he, he conducted his side? I knew, I know that he's on the other side. Would you say that he um, conducted the proceedings in a fair way? Yes. Okay. He didn't right. try to cheat the law or anything like that. He, he, basically was there to represent the case and he kept it away from his personal life but in the same aspect he was very professional about how he represented his case all right so even though he was on the other side of this particular case that you were involved in uh you didn't think that you, you thought that he conducted things fairly yes okay let's move on to this and uh this is uh one more weird thing about uh, this entire uh, case. This is the sighting of L. Uh, when did this happen? Uh, why don't you just explain how you found out about this and just what happened that particular day. It happened to be Father's Day, 10 days later after Al disappeared. Tell the listeners about it. Supposedly he was seen on the Avonmore Bridge 
and his father or his wife's mom's boyfriend saw him on Avonmore Bridge with two other guys, and they basically just went home, didn't do nothing. I was living in Parks Township down by Leechburg, which is 10, 15 minute drive up the road. And I drove the whole ways to there to the Avonmore Bridge, and I called my parents on the way and said, hey, he's supposedly seen at the Avonmore Bridge. So So let's just be clear about this. Who called you to tell you that? Her name is Dee. Okay, and we're just going to use her first name. How did she find out that Al was allegedly sighted on the Avonmore Bridge 10 days after he disappeared? Because Mike Bell called her and said that he was seen on the Avonmore Bridge, or he's seen him on the Avonmore Bridge. And who is Mike Bell? We're getting into some names here. I apologize, but this is the only way to explain this. I've, I've been through this with Matt a couple times. And and who is the Mike guy Bell? That he worked with. The guy that he worked with. So Al and Mike Bell uh, worked together. Yes. All right. So Brian Swank was also Mike Bell's boss. Correct. Okay. And he is saying that it was was it he that saw Al on the bridge that morning. Ten days later, this would have been once again Father's Day of 2013. Was it him or yeah. was it Butch or were they together? What's the story? The story was, is he seen them, it was in the evening, like right at dark, so I'd say probably like 8 o'clock it gets dark during the summertime, and Mike, or Butch and Jim Gold were driving down the road and seen them also from the other side of the bridge, and somehow L ran past them and ran up over a cliffside back towards where his car was found. Nobody called the cops who called the cops was is whenever I called my mom on the way, I told her what allegedly happened, and her and my father drove down to the bridge. Jim Gold and Butch, they both went home, and my parents called the cops. They called a chopper up in the air, and then they brought bloodhounds out. They seen nothing with the chopper, which was searching for heat. Mm-hmm. And then the bloodhounds pulled up. They thought they sent, but they couldn't say for sure if it was a scent. And then they explained with the bloodhounds, if anybody walks through behind the scent, it's only going to pick up the last scent. So basically, I drove from Leechburg to there as the cops were pulling in. And there was a white Chevy Silverado that whenever I drove up to the point road, to see if anything was up there that pulled out and left from there. I gave the state police the number and everything through 911 dispatch, and they said that it shows up to a dump truck, and I want to say it was Illinois. And I'm like, well, I definitely just seen the license plate. I was sat behind it for like five minutes, so if you, they would have came up, they would have seen that car, and they could have said, hey, what are you doing here? And do you believe it, you believe it was an Illinois a license plate or a Pennsylvania license plate? I know it was Illinois license plate. All right, you know it. So let's just go through this again. So allegedly, Mike Bell's on the Avonmore Bridge in the evening, and it just so happens that Butch and a buddy of his are on the bridge that evening as well. Yep. Uh, Mike Bell allegedly sees Al on the bridge, sitting there, standing there, walking there. He doesn't call the cops, but instead he goes up to this this woman D's house. No, he waited on the bridge. He called her on his cell phone. Oh, he called her on his cell phone, and he said he just saw L. Yep. Okay. And what did she do? She hung up the phone and called me and said that supposedly your brother's on the bridge. You better get down there. And who called the cops? My parents. You so you called them and told them, and that's they are the ones who called nine one one. Okay, so every you get there, the cops get there, the helicopter gets there, and then when did you, when is it determined that Butch and his friend they also say they saw L on the bridge? Probably about fifteen twenty minutes after I was down there, so I would say a good half hour forty five minutes after I got the phone call, because they went home and supposedly were going to go to bed. Have you uh, so that? But there was no sign. We're just taking these guys' word for it that they happened to see this. 
Um, did you ever have a chance to talk to Mike Bell about this? Have you ever had a chance or your parents to talk to Butch or this other guy about this? I spoke to Mike Bell about it, and he said that he was wearing leather jackets and stuff like that, which they all did wear leather jackets, but he only wore leather jackets if it was someplace fancy he was going to. So I don't really see if you're going to walk through the woods, you're going to take off running through the woods in a leather jacket. And so when you were talking to Mike Bell, just to be honest and frank, did you believe him? Not really. He seemed kind of sketchy. He was real fidgety. Wasn't really making too much sense. Especially knowing Dee told me everything that he told her and nothing was really adding up. Yeah, and then I'm sure it had it even get more bizarre from you when you discovered that Butch and this friend of his had kind of the same story. Yeah, because they didn't even match like the outfit or nothing. Do like he said he was wearing a different outfit. I'll put it that way. Mike Bell and Butch, they know each other through Brian, or is there some other connection between them? They know each other through Brian, and Mike Bell's brother is married to Butch's niece. It's a small world out there in Avonmore, Pennsylvania, Matt, it seems. Small world. Yep. So they have this sighting. The police show up. And was uh, Officer Owen Leonard there for this or not? No. Was this just the local police, uh, or was there were there I, state cops there? Who was there? State cops showed up. I didn't get any of the cops' names. They didn't even give a report or anything like that. And how did you uh, end up finding out that Butch also said he saw? Obviously, you talked to Mike Bell, but. With Butch, how did you find out that he also said he saw Al somewhere on the bridge or run up over the hill? Because we were all standing on the bridge, me and my parents, and then I could hear him talking to Christy's mother saying that he's seen him too. That he was with Jim Gould, and Jim Gould never came down. It was just Butch and Mike Bell there. And then eventually they talked to Jim somehow, and the description of the clothes, and everybody had the same matching up and Butch and Jim Gold were in the car together so as they were in the car together they at least have the same outfit and just so just to sum this up you had the sighting of Al nothing came of it no no sign of him we have to take the the word of these guys but neither Mike Bell nor Butch nor this friend of his who was with him none of them and I should say I guess D either None of them called the police. It took until it got, I guess, to your mother before anybody called the police. Yep. All right, the listeners they, can judge. They came down thinking that the cops were going to be there, and the cops weren't there, so then they called the police. So they just, you and they, you and your family just took for granted one of them called the police, and when you found out, when you got there, there was no police there, and that's when the call was made. Listeners will judge that, uh, see if what they think about that. Now, somebody we haven't talked about for a while, but we're going to go back to is Christy, the wife. Uh, where was she, just to, being that we just talked about that, where was she? Did she show up on the bridge that night? Did you see her there? Yeah, she showed up that night. And that was the real bizarre thing is they lived right next to Butch and them and Nobody even told her that they supposedly seen her seen Al on the bridge. So she, how did she find out that? I maybe, how did she find out? I'm not sure. No, no. Maybe Mike Bell told her or my mom. Okay. Did you did you have a chance to talk? You're there. Did you have a chance to talk to her at all? No. Didn't talk to her. How, in your opinion, what, what you know, how did you think that she handled Al disappearing? I thought she handled it very well. She wasn't really too sympathetic or anything like that. She didn't really show much expression. She didn't, you, She at least to you, of course, I don't know how much you really saw her. Maybe your parents saw her more if they wanted to go over and see their grandchild or something like that. Um... But to your knowledge, I mean, maybe if you could say, maybe speaking for your parents, uh, did she seem to grieve at all? 
that I'm unsure of. I know the one interview that they had with her, when the first one, she was crying during it, during the first one. So I don't know much after that. Like, I didn't really talk to him about how she acted or anything along those lines. Now, we have to remember, listeners have to remember, that at the time of Val's disappearance, he had a very young son, months old. And Christy, I'm sure, had her hands full. But uh, do you remember her helping any of the searches, anything like that, right after Al disappeared? She showed up to one a couple of the searches. She didn't really search or anything like that. Probably because she was caring for Emmett. But she was there. She was there. Yeah. Okay. Did she get married again after Al disappeared? No, but she has she had a living boyfriend after Al disappeared. And as far as you can tell, how quickly did this happen? Uh I'd say about a year, year and a half afterwards, maybe two. And do you, once again, to your knowledge, maybe if your parents knew, or once again, I, I should say this: after Al disappeared, did was it uh, has it been easy for your parents to see their grandchild? They had to go through court for grandparent rights because she was trying to hold them from them. Well, that's not a very good sign, Matt. Nope. And how? Um, when did this take place? How many months or a year after Al disappeared? Once again, into your recollection. They were buying everything for him for the longest time, and then they'd be able to see him here, see him there. Then just got to the point where she was with the other guy, and she didn't want to let him see him at all. So then they just put him in the court side. And how did that? Uh, did your Parents get some visitation rights or grandparent rights or not? Yeah, they got visitation rights. They okay. get them every Wednesday for four hours or three hours a day, and then every one Saturday a month and a half of holidays. It's kind of terrible it has to come to something like that, isn't it, Matt? And I know you have children, so it, it it's bad it has to come to that, isn't it? Yep. So you're saying about a year and a half – after Al disappeared, uh, she got involved uh, with another guy. We don't know about if she was involved in anybody else in that meantime, but we're not going to get into his name, but he is a convicted felon, isn't he? Yes. He spent time in jail. Yep, and currently. And he's currently in jail? Yep. Is he, uh, do you know, is he from that area of Avonmore? Or, uh, but he, he's not from around there, is he? No, he's from Connellsville. Connellsville, which is also in Westmoreland County, but south of yeah. uh, where uh, you are and where I grew up. Okay, so she um, had this new guy. Uh, does she have any kids by the new guy? Yes. All right. So she moved on eventually. And we have to remind the listeners that this is, this did happen in uh, 2013, so about five years ago. Now, this is going to go back to the early parts of our conversation, this conversation between you and Al when you were working on that house. What ended up happening to that house? After a while, she ended up buying a bigger house or I should say acquiring a bigger house. I don't know if she bought it or what she did. And then her parents, or her mom and her mom's boyfriend ended up moving into it. So I guess what I'm saying is, Al, when he was working with you in the house, he got the feeling that he was making this building there, working, remodeling this house, not for himself, but for Christy's parents, or her mother and her boyfriend. And in the end, that's exactly what happened. They did end up living in that house. Yep. I bet I, I'm going to guess maybe you think that that's a little strange, a little too coincidental. Yep. <laughs> yep. You're a man of a uh, few words, Matt. But I, I, <laughs> I, I uh, but I, I know that uh, we've, you know, listeners should know that Matt and I have had a lot of talks before we convinced, c- conducted this interview. And I think we've gotten to know each other uh, very well. And, um, 
Uh, he uh, he has very passionate feelings about what what, ha what happened here. So, uh, but just to to clear this up once again, uh, Christie's mother and her boyfriend did move into the house after Al disappeared. Do you remember how soon after? No, I'd say probably about three years after, maybe four. Okay, so not right away then. Okay. All right. Um, let's maybe move into the conclusion of this interview. I just one of the most uh, strangest cases I've covered on Unfound. There's no doubt about it. With these sightings in the car, and uh, Al's boss and the the cop who shows up on the scene knowing each other really well, and they're kind of related through marriage. A lot of very weird coincidences and things you could be very suspicious about. Uh, I'm just going to ask you point blank, Matt. Do you believe that Al was involved in something with Brian, Butch, and others that they might have wanted to make him disappear? No, not really. Not unless he might have seen something that he wasn't supposed to, but I know he wouldn't put himself in the, something where he could get himself in trouble. Mm -hmm. Because we do have to remember that it, just like you said, a couple months before he disappeared, he did say that he thought somebody was following him. Yes. And uh, maybe I didn't ask you at the time, but did he ever say if it was a truck, a car? No, he never stated what type of vehicle he thought was following him. He just said that he thought somebody was following him around. And in any conversations uh, that you had with him, uh, did he ever say anything that, I mean, he knew Mike Bell, he knew Butch, anything that he ever said that he was fearful of them, that uh, suspicious of them, said. anything, or uh, Brian Bell, or yes, Mike Bell, I should say, Mike Bell, Butch, Brian Swank, ever afraid of any of them? He never mentioned that he was afraid of them. You could tell his opinion on them for once. He didn't have a very high opinion of them at all. No. Okay. No, because if he would have had high opinions of them, he would have told me, "Yeah, go ahead and fly." But I got to look like I'm retarded. Whenever I said about flying where he was working. What are the chances, uh, Matt, uh, that he did run off into the woods and he just hasn't been discovered yet? and um, committed suicide. I mean, did he own a gun or anything? Did, uh, is it is anything did, um, missing or anything like that? He did own two guns, or he owned three guns. He owned a shotgun, a twenty two, and then a twenty five, which is a prehistoric gun. You can't get ammunition for it. But the odds of him being in the woods and nobody discovered him yet, I would say is probably about one in a thousand because I hunt with 15 to 25 different guys, and we've hunted this since I was 14. And we drive it two miles each direction, and then after you turn around, we drive the whole top out, then we drive the whole, basically we drive the whole mountain side out, so somebody would have seen something. Okay. Because I'm just going to say that it could it be that you know, he was thinking about doing something up on that ATV trail that morning, and the reason he took the Elantra is because even though it does have bald tires, it is front-wheel drive, whereas the Mustang is rear-wheel drive and maybe isn't going to be able to get up that trail uh, as easily. Just a thought. Just a thought. I don't think so because the Mustang has good, or it had good tires on it, and he drove that car a lot more so you would have had more skills with that car and it's very similar to what we used to camp at and stuff like that where you got to go up over mountain sides so he if he would have drove up i think he would have used the car that he was more familiar driving not one that basically just sat around and collected dust because you couldn't sell it to anybody okay uh in in the since he disappeared and um You've had a, a, a chance to, of course, talk to your parents about this, maybe your friends, um, other people who maybe knew Al and liked him. Not, of course, these other suspicious people, but people who liked him. Um, 
Have any of them ever been able to give you any explanation of why Al would have been at the Honey Bear that morning in the opposite direction from where his car was found? Any thoughts at all? Nope. Nobody ever came up with a conclusion. Nobody ever said why he would be out there. And what boggles me is, is from where the Honey Bear is to his work is about four miles away, so why would you backtrack the whole ways back to Avonmore? And then basically turn around and go the back way mm-hmm. to your work. Right. Maybe that's a good question uh, to ask you. This this road that this ATV trail kind of goes off, um, would that have been the road that he would have taken to go to work? Yeah. It would have. Okay. All right. What's this been like uh, for you? You got to see him a lot. What's it? What's it been like for you the last five years, Matt? You know, to to live with this, and and you know, I'll talk about your parents in a second, but you personally, it's basically just a big mystery. It's kind of odd that there's never been even a clue to anything. I don't understand, like, with all the modern day technology or anything, they should have at least been able to come up with some sort of information. People just don't disappear and out of nowhere and stay gone for 30, 40 years. Somebody sees you eventually. Do you miss them? Yes. Yeah, I'm sure you do. It seems that, of course, you didn't live far away from each other. You're seeing each other maybe quite often, especially with remodeling of the house. It uh, had to have left um, you know, a big hole in your life. You know, for the last yeah. five years. It's kind of odd because whenever my youngest daughter was born, she has his exact hair color, almost everything, personality, you name it. Hmm. And what about your parents? Uh, how, uh, you know, people, different people and, and families grieve in different ways. But as I've learned about disappearances, you know, parents, of course, are, take it the hardest. When a child disappears, what's it been like for them? If you feel like you can speak for them, it's been an emotional roller coaster for them. You can tell that it affects them drastically. There's times that you can tell that it's really upsets them. Do they talk about them, or is that just something that uh, you just can't do without maybe it becoming some very emotional uh, experience? I try not to bring it up unless they bring it up, so that way I don't risk that factor. They do talk about them. They'll say about how Emmett has different traits and different stuff like that. They'll say how he he always was in certain things and stuff like that. And maybe I should ask you this, just a technical question. Uh, uh, This phone that it was found, anything found on it, any suspicious phone calls, texts, Anything else on, on his phone uh, that could be traced to that morning that he disappeared? Obviously, if we're to believe it got pinged, but actually any use that he had of it that morning? I, w- or by what I remember, there was nothing on it, and that's another thing that threw me off because the morning of if there's nothing on it, how are you pinging your phone to get to the location from where that sent from or where that call was made from? But I don't recall any phone calls or text messages getting through at that time. Okay. Like, I should say that day. That day. Because you can't ping a phone. Basically, whenever you ping a phone and says the location where your text message was, where the location of the call was, you can't pick yeah. up a moving phone. And what what kind of self reception is in the area where this car was found? Can you get good cell reception in that area? Yes. Okay, so it is possible. Great reception. So it is possible that it could have. It's possible that it could have been pinged and it was on, and it's possible. Yeah. Okay. Do you believe that um, Al disappeared because some sort of foul play, Matt? I think there could have been foul play because if there, if basically why wouldn't the car be in the open if it wasn't foul play? So, yeah, I believe foul play could have been involved. 
I think if a proper investigation was done in the first place, there would have been a lot more answers. Mm -hmm. Do you think, uh, just to be, being that hey, the, the listeners heard it, what you had to say uh, about all of this, do you think that uh, this state cop who showed up knowing Brian Swank as well as uh, they do know each other, do you think that that has complicated this investigation? I think it hindered a lot of the investigation because of an officer of the law, you're supposed to look out for the public and the safety of the public. And if you know you're related to a party, you shouldn't be on the case because you're going to obviously form bias them right off the bat and say, okay, we're going to go with whatever this guy said. So you believe, uh, I guess it's fair to say then, that uh, you're not inclined to believe these sightings of him t of Al 10 days later, and you think that something strange or very out of the ordinary that went on that morning and just something that maybe Al didn't seem coming? Yes. Well, I know, uh, Matt, uh, people should know you contacted me first, and we've actually been talking for a while, a couple months now. You contacted me first about Al's case, and I would not, even though I'm from the area, I would not heard of it. I'll just be honest uh, with everybody about that. Um, it's uh, I've enjoyed talking to you about it. We've thrown around a lot of theories um, that are confidential and some things, uh, but... Uh, I hope that uh, we continue to can continue to talk about this case, and um, you know I'll continue to help you in any way I can. I feel kind of connected to this case because I know this area very very well. Um, any last words before we conclude this interview, Matt? Not this time. Okay, uh, Matt. I want to thank you. I've enjoyed uh, talking to you. I want to continue to talk about Al's case if we can. Uh, we're friends on Facebook, and I want you to know that you can contact me anytime. And I appreciate you joining me on this episode of Unfound. No problem. Have a great day. You too, Matt. And that was my interview with Matt Copper, brother of Al Copper. I thank him for joining me and all of you on this episode. As I said in the interview, Matt contacted me after the first article appeared in the Tribune Review back in January. That is when he discovered the Trib would be doing monthly coverage on older missing persons cases in western Pennsylvania. He wondered if his brother's case could be featured. The Trib and I came to the conclusion that since there had already been an article in the Trib last summer about Al, that I instead would cover his disappearance on an unfound episode. What I didn't know at the time was how much more information was behind the scenes concerning this disappearance. So frankly, I'm hoping that the Trib will cover Al's disappearance later this year, and this time include many of the points that were brought out in this interview. Now, I need to ask you, is your gut feeling buzzer going off? Mine certainly did after talking to Matt the first time. You just can't get away from the feeling that something bad happened here, and that it was criminal although there is virtually nothing here that says that. No proof that Al was into anything illegal. His wife didn't seem to have a boyfriend waiting in the wings. The sighting of Al ten days later could have just been some guys joking around, or it was somebody else who was on the bridge. It wouldn't be the first time somebody was trying to be helpful in a missing persons case, but was wrong. The state cop and Brian Swank being related? Lots of business people and police officers are related. But still... Something within me, and I think most of you, knows something isn't right. So, what can be done about it? My recommendation to the Copper family would be to focus on how the car was exactly found so fast. This is the part of Al's disappearance that makes no sense to me, given everything I've learned about missing persons cases. If it is true that Al's phone was pinged, Matt was correct in saying that there was a cop who was murdered in Westmoreland County within the last year and the police didn't ping the killer's phone for four days. But with Al's disappearance, they pinged the phone within hours. It does seem suspicious. With that, I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. 
If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a five-star review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.